for managing to complete the other ones really well. And we've just got uh, a few more lessons to go on this topic. So we're well and truly about three quarters of the way through. So well done, everybody, for the great work that you're doing, including sending some videos through as some of you making your own volcanoes. Um, superb work on tsunamis. Uh, very, very impressed with what I'm seeing so far. So do keep it up as well as some superb scores on the quiz. Just a reminder, though, do make sure that you have the notes from the PowerPoint when you do the quiz. Some of you are making really silly mistakes. And I think it's because you're just trying to do the quiz. Cheating, probably. We've all done it. But if you could make sure that you have the notes and the PowerPoint open, it will make life much easier and also give you some fantastic scores so I can add lots of points onto ePraise. So a bit of an unusual starter this time. OK, I want us to sort of think about the work we've been doing so far um, with our volcanoes and earthquakes. Now, the idea behind this is I've attached this form into Teams as a PDF and you need to cut it up. And you have if you notice that you have got um, the words in bold like earthquake, OK, those are your keywords and you need to position these so that where you've got the definition next to it and it ends up building up a triangle. When you have the full answer and you were to position them, they would form a triangle. OK, so within them it would look, sorry, excuse my amazing drawing on the screen at the same time. Let's try and do it like this. OK, so you will have a series of answers there so that you can position them quite closely. OK, that's really badly drawn. OK, so you cut them out and you match, as I say, the keyword with its definition. So have a go at that. You'll need to put yourself on pause because I'm sure that this will take a little while to do. OK. So you put yourself on pause, you had a go, and hopefully this here is the answer that you got. And you can see that if you had earthquakes at the very top here, that you had, you should be able to put that one out because you had the title, earthquakes and volcanoes, and then you match it up with the definition underneath, which is vibrations caused, etc, etc. OK, so well done if you managed to get that completed. OK, so today's lesson title is called Why Can't Mum Go to Iceland? Now, I'm hoping that you've guessed I don't really mean the supermarket because we could have lots of reasons like that at the moment, including probably because mum can't be bothered to queue for half an hour just to go to get you guys some ice lollies. So we're obviously not looking at that. We're still looking at volcanoes. So our learning objectives to identify the causes of a volcanic eruption in a high income country to examine the impacts of the volcanic eruption and to evaluate the responses of a volcanic eruption and compare high and low income countries. Now, just to get you thinking, some of these titles that we come up with are a little bit different. So last week I set you the title of should I stay, should I go or should I stay now? And we were looking here at the volcano in Montserrat and the reason that I had that title was I wanted you to be thinking about the issue of where people were trying to decide whether or not they should evacuate. So in 1995 when it had the first volcanic eruption a lot of people evacuated and then people start to come back because they go well volcano's over nothing's happening so they all start returning and the problem you've got there is that two years later there was an almighty eruption of pyroclastic flow and more people died and now half of that island is uninhabitable and this is one of the issues we have with volcanic eruptions is with an earthquake for example the earthquake happens and you might get some aftershocks but most people probably start to return to that area with a volcano is the volcanic eruption can actually go on for a very long period of time and as you saw with last week's, it was over a couple of years and people end up going, well, I think it's fine and come back. And that's the difficulty they've got is they're never quite sure when it's safe. Now, today's example is a little bit different, although it happened over a period of time. It didn't happen over a couple of years. It was over a period of about a month. OK. So to fit in where we got this, so just as a reminder, 
of where this all fits in. We've covered those first three. OK, we're just now looking at our high income countries of volcanoes and we have one more lesson next week on volcanoes. And then we're going to start thinking about the earthquakes and volcanoes, about living in hazardous areas uh, and what people can do about it. So before we really look at this particular example, as always, we need to be able to locate where we're talking about. So we're talking about Iceland. OK, up here. We are located here. And if we zoom in. We've got Iceland here. Now, what's quite interesting is this, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Now, some of you may have been lucky enough to have gone to Iceland. We ran a school trip there a few years ago. We've always hoped to get another one there. Uh, Mrs Shipman was lucky enough to go. And, and for those who remember, Miss Taylor, uh, she went as well. And I think in the corridor outside my classroom, there's still some photographs there. I may be mistaken, I may have been taken down now. Uh, but the photographs there you can see. And in some parts of Iceland, you can actually see where the plate is moving apart. It's called a constructive plate margin. It's constructive because if you recall, as the plates gradually are poured apart, it creates a gap in the Earth's crust that new magma rises up and constructs new crust. So in parts of Iceland, you can actually see where those plates are moving apart. It's also a place where there has natural hot springs and in the middle of winter, you can actually go swimming in really, really hot water there. So this is here and the example that we are looking at is this volcano here. Now, I cannot pronounce it. It starts as something like Ayayaka and it ends in full. If you really want to know how to pronounce it, put it into Google Translate and it will say it or wait till you're back at school and ask Mrs Shipman because she is about the only person I know that can say it very, very fluently. So this is the volcano that we're looking at and you can see that it's right on the edge of this Atlant mid Atlantic ridge where the volcano, where the crust is pulling apart. And remember, when we are doing our description of a location, we have clocks. So we want to think about the continent it's in. The line of latitude, so whether it's the northern or southern hemisphere, any oceans and seas that are nearby, any surrounding countries, and also the reason I've got compass rows here, the compass directions, is it, you know, is it to the south of the UK or is it to the north, or uh, can you narrow it down to say southeast, northwest, etc. So write a good description to be able to locate it. So let's get some key facts and work out exactly what happened then with this volcano. So it started about 20th of March 2010. This is when people first started to realise something was going on. But actually, seismologists and geologists and volcanologists, all of those together, have since gone back and looked. And they reckon that the first signs of anything happening were in about 1994. But up to that point, it hadn't really done anything. But in about 20th March 2010, a 500 metre fissure opened up. That's a, a sort of crack that opened up within it. Now, what's quite significant with this particular volcano is that most of it happened under an ice sheet. Now, at this time of year, Iceland is still very cold. We, for those of you who can recall from work that we did in year eight, when we looked at um, ice caps and ice sheets and our cold as ice topic, that ice sheets will form in these very, very cold environments. So it was sat underneath it. Now, what happened is when the heat from the volcano came up, it met with the coldness of that ice sheet and that creates steam. And that then meant that it caused um, a sort of huge explosion in doing so eventually when all of this happened. It dissolved all the gases and caused a build up. Uh, and that then meant a whole load of volcanic ash came up. Now, just to give you an example, don't do this at home because the last thing I want you to do is cause a problem. But some of you may have done this. Say, for example, you've cooked some bacon at home. You've made mum and dad a nice bacon sandwich, treated them, and you've got the hot frying pan and you shouldn't do it because one, it creates steam and causes us a problem. And two, it can ruin your frying pan. But if you immediately put that hot pan after you've taken the bacon out into uh, a source of water to wash your pan, you get that enormous steam come up. So that's imagine this ice sheet, which is huge, vast area underneath a whole load of magma coming up. You can imagine the sort of explosion that you would get. And this here sort of explains it in a little bit more detail. So this is what I was saying about in 1994. So we'll have a look here. This is our sort of cross section of our volcano. So we've obviously got the surface and then we've got ice on the top. 
and then we have here the vent now last two weeks ago when you got to do a lesson on volcanoes we did what's called a stereotypical drawing of a volcano where we have the vent and you have a magma chamber underneath but actually we can often end up with a series of these so in the vent we have what's called sills now sills are sort of intrusions so imagine that the magma has been pushed up and then it moves horizontally underneath the volcano and this is where it can sit and be stored and it cools down once it's been pushed up and found a little crack a fissure it's moved its way into there and then it will cool down and maybe not a lot will happen with it and these are horizontal so in 1994 some of the magma had intruded into these seals creating some horizontal lines five years later same thing happened again and it created as you can see here another seal and if you look at the cross sections what you can see is here they store quite a lot of magma now 11 years later during january to march of 2010 magma created even more seals you can see here and also this here which is a vertical intrusion so these seals are horizontal and this dike here is called a vertical intrusion and you can see that the magma is being pushed up and as it gets pushed up it can create a bulge in the mountain so people like volcanologists who are studying volcanoes may look and if they start to see a change in shape of that volcano there's every chance that magma is beginning to push upwards in this uh, formation of Corda dike and the mountain starts to grow because all that rock has to go somewhere so on march the 20th in 2010 what then happened is above the dike here lava began to pour out and that's called an effusive eruption and that effusive just means lava was pouring out and then a little while later a couple of weeks later so april the 14th to may the 22nd so a series of explosive eruptions on the ice cap summit so remember what i said about that ice the coldness of the ice meeting with the heat and creating a huge amount of steam and it was this event from the 14th of April that caused this, which meant that lovely planes that fly suddenly weren't able to. And so we'll look at that in terms of its impact. Now, what I'd like you to do is watch this video, okay, so that you can see what actually happened during the eruption. Hopefully it will play. Note the dates at the top.
okay so from that hopefully you were able to see that you know millions of people were affected and it cost airlines sort of you know, billions of pounds in the end and it was all over the world and we'll have a look at some of the reasons for that in a minute Okay, so if we look at these photographs here, these here are some of the images that you can see of what happened with the volcano. So first of all, we've got to think about the settlement. So think about some of the social impacts. Think about these people that live in this settlement here. This photograph, I think, is really spectacular when you actually look at the lightning that came from it. And it apparently created some spectacular localised storms. We've got some lava relatively slow moving. And as always, whenever there's a volcano, people are always attracted to come and have a look at it. And this here is a satellite image and you can see that the volcano is here and this is just the line of ash cloud just moving across towards the UK. And obviously another human impact, but as well as economic, because in terms of the cost, you've got the airlines being cancelled and that just left about 150,000 Britons were stranded. Uh, along with millions of people around the world who weren't able to get back to where they should be for going to or going from. So how were people affected locally? So within Iceland, we've got the areas were flooded because of the glacier melt which lay above the volcano and this is what's really important is it wasn't just the fact there was all this steam but all that ice that sat on top of the volcano melted and it then flooded a huge amount of the land lower down not only was that land flooded it was also a lot of the agricultural land agriculture means used for farming was destroyed uh, because of the heavy ash fall and then they obviously poisoned some of the animals in the nearby farms. So, you know, quite tragically, some of the animals uh, were very sick. Some of the roads were destroyed because they were either flooded or washed away. And people were asked to stay indoors because of the ash in the air. Now, I know this is significant. I know this would have been a real problem, but I want you at the back of your mind to keep thinking what happened in Montserrat that we looked at last lesson where we had about 20 people killed. We had people who, you know, 8,000 people at some point were evacuated from that island. And most of those did not return back to it. So they had to be completely relocated. Here, people were told to stay indoors. Yes, people would have had their farmland uh, destroyed and some animals, but nobody's lives were permanently disrupted. Let's think about around Europe and globally. So the first flights were cancelled between the 14th of April and they resumed again on about the 22nd of April. Now, one of the reasons they had to cancel these flights is what happens is the volcanic ash goes up into the sky, plane flies through it, plane flies through it and the volcanic ash has lots and lots of sort of particles in it that if they get stuck in the engines and the heat from the engines will crystallize them and basically turn it to sort of like glass then type of cement so the engines won't spin and that's clearly a problem because planes need the engines and without the engines they will fall from the sky and this was discovered in the 1980s there was a flight that was going uh, I think it was to New Zealand and it flew through an eruption volcano in Indonesia and I, I remember years ago seeing some film footage where it was the passengers were being interviewed and it was a really quite scary interview when they were saying to them so what was it like and they said they're in a jumbo jet and a jumbo jet has four engines and they can actually fly on one so the pilot comes on to the flight because dust and that is getting into the cabin so these passengers can think what they think is smoke they don't realize it's an ash cloud that they're flying through so the pilot comes on, ladies and gentlemen, we're just experiencing a few problems. Uh, we're just flying through a volcanic eruption and that's why you've got ash coming into your cabin. So, OK, a few seconds later, ping, ping. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. Um, one of our engines ha we've now lost due to the uh, ash cloud that we've just flown through. But don't worry, we've got three more, but we'll try and find an airport to land as a bit of an emergency. As he's still talking 
and saying we've lost one engine he then says oh sorry we've lost a second oh we've lost the third ladies and gentlemen we have now lost all four engines now you can imagine at that point that would probably be the point where most people probably want to cry poop their pants whatever say goodbye to their loved ones and the plane basically glided with no engines for i think about 15 minutes as they were desperately trying to get the engines restarted and getting lower and lower seeking an airport and then when they were just a few thousand feet from the ground they managed to clear the engines and actually did get three of the four engines restarted and did make a safe landing but after that point a review was done of this and a big inquiry and they said that planes must not fly through volcanic ash they were just lucky that they had enough height left from its original height and enough time not a great big mountain in its way that they were able to get those engines restarted so that's why all of those flights were grounded as a result businesses lost trade because they couldn't move them around the world air operators lost millions of pounds each day perishable foods foods that would go off that we now are used to so if you know if i want strawberries in the middle of winter i can get them from somewhere else around the world they've all been picked they're ready to be transported and they were just lost no one bought them so lots of people lost money people were not able to get to work because they were stranded and it happened at the end of the easter holiday so lots of people on holiday they'd gone off for easter and then they couldn't get back to work and this leads to this mystery that i'm going to get you to solve now on the next page there's a number of statements that i want you to read to help you understand what happened about how people could be affected and we've got a pretend family known as the harveys and you need to read the statements carefully because it's going to help you do the next tasks so here's our statements okay there's 22 statements and i'd like you to see whether you can sort of color code them and try and think about anything where it's talking specifically about the icelandic volcano anything specifically where it's talking about the harveys and anything specific about why planes can't fly okay so three things anything about the icelandic volcano anything about the harveys and anything as to why planes can't fly including some of that historical information um, from the 1980s when planes had flown through it right so i'm hoping you've gone through that and color coded those and now i want you to have a go at answering these five questions so the first one is to look back through it and tell me where the harveys went on holiday and when did they go because the dates are obviously very significant as to where they were which links with number two at the time of the icelandic volcano and then that will tell you for number two when it also erupted so number three what happened to all the flights following the eruption number four what could happen to the aeroplane's engines if they got volcanic ash in them what evidence was there that this had happened before remember use specific dates tell me where that flight was tell me what volcano they'd gone through tell me the dates don't just say it went through and there was a problem before really expand upon those answers and number five i want you to write a summary of about a paragraph imagine that george harvey was late for work i.e how did the cancelled flights impact him okay well done for completing that now we've gone through this and quite a few of these slides talked about the different effects so we talked about the local effects for example the ice melting and causing flooding and the ash on the farms and we've talked about the global and european effects so the lack of uh, planes flying the perishable goods etc but what I want us to do is to try to take all of those facts from today's lesson and put them into three categories. Social, so anything about people, so whether people were moved, whether they, um, whether they were evacuated, whether they couldn't get to work, so anything at all about people, the impact it had on their everyday lives. Anything economic, so cost to businesses and individuals, and anything environmental, for example, the flooding would be environmental, the ash would be environmental think as well now about separating these so that we're separating the local and we're separating across Europe and the rest of the world and I've got a bit of a challenge there which group local or global do you think were affected the most and give reasons so I said we were going to try and evaluate a little bit as to the differences between our high and low income examples of volcanic eruptions and I want you to think about which was the actual worst one so i want you to consider 
if you were to say, I believe that the Montserrat volcano was worse, or I believe that the Icelandic volcano was worse, we need clear evidence. And I'd like you to consider the numbers of people and how they were affected, the scale of the disaster, what aid and responses were needed and the long term impact. So is it just over and that's it? Or actually have people still been affected about it now? I've got a challenge here, though. It's a challenge thought. What is worse, economic or social costs? Quite often in a low income disaster, there can be a lower economic cost, but a higher social cost. More people are likely to lose their homes, but the value of maybe jobs and businesses isn't as high. In high income countries, the social impacts can often be lower, but the economic cost can be higher. But a high economic cost can then affect people socially because it might mean a business is destroyed and eventually those people with this knock on effect will be that they don't have a job. So have a think and just try and wait up. There isn't a specific answer for this. It's why I put challenge thought. I just want you to think about it. It's always got to be at the back of your mind. And this often helps in terms of responses that we will be going on to later on as to why people might live in these areas, because are they prepared to take that risk? OK, so this pretty much brings us to the end of looking at our Icelandic volcano. Um, I have also attached a PDF file to Teams. So if somebody wants to have a go at making your own model, feel free to and you can send me some photographs of them. Or if any more, if you want to make any cake models, uh, models that erupt, anything that you want to do, have a go and feel free to send me some photographs of them. And then finally, as always, the quiz link. So well done, everybody. Keep going with the hard work and see you for next week's lesson. Bye bye.